So welcome everybody to tonight's webinar for the Digital Ethnic Futures Consortium Funding Opportunities. I am Rupika Rizm. I am the director of the Digital Ethnic Futures Consortium and the principal investigator for this project. And we have uh, with us Keja Valens, uh, who's also a PI on the project. Keja, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Keja Valens. I am um, at Salem State University, um, co-PI on this project and um, responsible for a lot of the financial pieces. So um, if you end up applying for one of these, you will get messages from me um, when it comes to filling out the financial forms. This is true. And, and Keja is a whiz at managing finances. <laughs> So to, to give you a brief overview um, of our project, first of all, you can get a copy of our slides using this QR code. In here, you will find information about DEF CON, as we call it, as well as all the information presented um, today in our webinar, uh, including links to applying for our funding opportunities. Uh, you can also, uh, we'll post a copy of the slides and a copy of the recording to our website. And our website is digitalethnicfutures.org. So you'll always be able to get that information there as well. Keisha, if you are able to drop a link to the slides in the chat, could you please, if you have those open? If not, I'll do it when you're talking. I'll do it in just a second. I have it open, but it takes me a sec, but I'll get there. <laughs> awesome. So I've introduced myself, Keisha's introduced uh, herself. We also have three other PIs on the project. Sonia Donaldson, a uh, formerly of New Jersey City University, who's now at Colby College. And we're fortunate that we'll be joined by two of her colleagues from NJCU uh, who will be joining us on, on our team as well. Tanisha Taylor, who's at Texas Southern University, and Jamila Moore Pugh, who's at Cal State Fullerton. Essentially, the purpose of di the Digital Ethnic Futures Consortium is to foster opportunities for connection, for events, for professional development, for networking, for those of us who are working at the intersections of digital humanities and ethnic studies fields, so that could be African diaspora studies, Latinx studies, uh, Native and Indigenous studies, Asian American mm -hmm. studies, and uh, to help you know bring us together and to find community and support for our work. Keisha, you wanna take the next uh, couple of slides? Um, so, um... Part of what we are really working on is developing um, a network. And part of what um, happens is, of course, um, digital ethnic humanities is often not um, a large enough field for us to have a big full departments um, and communities, especially in um, regional, comprehensive regional public universities. Um, and so having this network where we can, we can really build um, a department of um, practitioners who um, share work beyond um, individual institutions. Um, and what that does then is to increase national capacity um, for digital humanities, particularly um, curriculum. Um, and so um, thinking about the ways in which we build this, um, not um, only in our research, but in our teaching in ways um, that engage with minoritized, minoritized communities, um, both our students um, who are in those positions and um, the communities beyond um, the university. Um, and um, the way, part of the way that this has to happen is um, that um, we work and there's really a lot of fantastic um, mentoring. There's so many folks in this room um, who have been working really hard on figuring out how to have reciprocal and redistributive relationships with communities, right? Um, and so how do we not just um, make the um, communities that we engage with the objects of our study, but actually partners um, in that study? And that is one of the things that, um, as many of you know, digital humanities allows us um, to do that in some really exciting ways. So 
should I keep going? Um, no, I think we can, um, we can do this. Hold on. I'm trying to, um, deal with a, a zoom issue that I think is fixed. Yeah, I think it's fixed. Okay. I apologize for those of you who are getting spamming, getting spam messages about, um, various teaching tools. I believe this, I've removed them from the zoom. So yeah, so basically we have been given funding by the Mellon Foundation to do precisely all of the things that Keja has just uh, talked to us about to actually develop the organization itself, which is the focus of our work at Salem State. Uh, I'm formerly of Salem State. I'm now at Dartmouth. I'm still working on the, on the project though. Um, to promote collaboration knowledge and knowledge mobilization and exchange uh, to find ways of sharing strategies for implementing curricular initiatives with our speaker series, our networking events, our virtual annual meeting, um, all of which are described on our website, digitalethnicfutures.org. Large chunks of the $3 million have gone for financial support to New Jersey City University, Texas Southern University, and Cal State Fullerton to help them scale up and build on their work that they've been doing in digital humanities at an institutional level and to and get them to do some work around building regional networks for digital humanities and ethnic studies, which is something that's been going on. We have a very wonderful and thriving group of Cal State folks um, involved, which has been really wonderful. Uh, we've also been able to use this opportunity to build relationships with research intensive universities. So for example, UT Austin has come on as one of our, as our first institutional partner. Uh, what that means is they're committing to using their institutional resources to support digital humanities um, in ethnic studies fields. And so we launched that this year, which is very exciting. And then while you're all here, expanding the capacity beyond the four partner institutions um, by offering re-granted funds and mentorship for course and curriculum development for faculty and librarians at public universities that aren't R1 universities. So this was a grant that was specifically uh, interesting to Mellon because it was aiming to support the kinds of universities that don't usually get Mellon funding. And so that's why that's a restriction on receiving a teaching fellowship or a capacity building fellowship. That's not a restriction on being a mentor. Uh, mentors can be anyone, um, but the restriction is anyone um, who works you know, it doesn't have to be at a university, it could be at a cultural heritage institution, it could be an all act position, uh, but who works in the US or US territory, which is also a stipulation of Mellon funding. So we have three um, funding programs. Um, Keja, would you like to talk about the teaching fellowships and then I'll talk about the capacity building fellowships because I need to show the application. Yes, um, so the teaching fellowships, um, uh, really support um, transformation or creation of one course. Um, and um, what, um, so these are, these are fellowships that can work for either um, an existing course that you um, would like to transform, often adding one of the two pieces, right? So if you have an ethnic studies course um, and you want to make it a digital ethnic studies course, um, this, that, right? So it's a, it's a transformational opportunity um, for a course um, that really gets you to um, learn often um, all kinds of digital tools um, and practices, but thinking really about how that transforms into um, coursework, um, course assignments, um, getting students involved um, with act, not just using um, digital tools, but actually doing some creation. Um, and um, we have an incredible so so there the the way that this works as Rupsi was saying is there is um, a combination of stipend for your time um, and mentorship right um, so looking through and figuring out um, how do you do everything from developing goals and objectives that um, that relate to um, digital ethnic studies developing measurements um, and assessments um, and then the actual you know, sort of developing the project that you do or the projects that you do with your students and embedding them in the courses. 
Um, yeah. So, oh yeah. Go ahead. Oh, and and so um so there's regular meetings um with the with the mentors. Um, and there's also meetings with the groups of fellows. So you get to work on your own um, prod class, um, but also start to join that community um, and see what other folks are doing um, and, and learn um, in community. Um, so anyone, all faculty and teaching librarians, um, right, again, um, at public colleges and universities, excluding our ones um, in um, the US and its territories. Perfect. Thank you. And so the deliverable is essentially by September 1st, 2023, it's the end of the, the fellowship term. Um, the per people who receive teaching fellowships will submit a syllabus along with any activities or assignments developed. Um, and those will be posted in our humanities commons groups. And we're also very lucky that we have two of our teaching fellows from last year um, here with us. Uh, today. So when we get to the Q&A part, you know, we may ask them if they want to um, add anything um, based on their experience. And the application for this is pretty simple. Um, it's essentially, I realize I should just show this one too. Um, we basically are asking you, you know, your basic information. We're asking you to rate your experience with digital humanities, your experience uh, with ethnic studies. We would expect that you would have experience with one of these things. Um, this may be challenging if you're sort of coming without knowledge of, of either. Um, that isn't necessarily an exclusion um, or a deal breaker, but um, this is a lot easier if you feel like you have um, a foundation in one of these areas. Um, if you've taught digital humanities or if you've taught ethnic studies before, um, a title for your proposed course, a description for your proposed course, um, whether your department will schedule you to teach the course in 2023-2024, um, and uh, what kinds of, what formats of mentorship would you prefer? So would you prefer to only meet one-to-one -one with a person? Would you like a small group? Would you like a mix of both? And then also a question that asks you to anticipate what kinds of support you think that you would need to create your course um, that integrates digital humanities and an ethnic studies field. And, and I just want to add the piece about um, this being a course that the question about will your department schedule this um, in 23-24, um, um, that is not a deal breaker. Um, so, um, and, and it doesn't have to be uh, you know, we know, first of all, the department may plan to schedule it and not be able to schedule it. Um, you know, it may not run for any number of reasons, um, but also, you know, it's sort of, it's to, it's to gauge, um, if we're making hard decisions, we may end up prioritizing um, uh, courses that are likely to be offered in the relatively near future, um, but um, that's, that's more informational um, than kind of winnowing. Yeah, absolutely. Because thank you for mentioning that, Kasia. Because last year we gave teaching fellowships to people who weren't able to necessarily guarantee that they would be able to teach the course precisely for those reasons that, you know, we know courses get canceled um, or you need to put it through governance first. And we totally understand that. So don't let that be a deterrent to applying, please. So the capacity building fellowships, uh, we've slightly changed from last year. Um, the deadline for all of our programs is, is January 13th. And what a capacity building fellowship is, is a $5,000 stipend along with assigned mentor uh, support to develop capacity for curriculum that integrates knowledge of digital humanities with ethnic studies. So our definition of what it means to build capacity is very broad. Um, we recognize that our individual institutions may need different kinds of support to build capacity. So you might be here thinking, you know what, we're ready to create a minor or we're ready to create a certificate and we'd like these funds, you know, to support the time of the people who are going to be do working on the documentation and creating the courses. That's one way to build capacity. You may look at your institution and say, you know what, we really need some time for a faculty learning community where we give some stipends to the faculty. They meet together over the course of the year and we're going to develop assignments or develop a course together. 
That's the way of building capacity. You might say, you know what? We really need to bring someone to campus and have a workshop and we need to fund that. That's another way to build capacity. So essentially, you know, and those are not the only examples. Those are just a couple examples that, that we came up with. Um, so the application itself is a proposal for what your campus would need to build capacity, to move digital humanities at your campus beyond a single course uh, into something that maybe happens in multiple courses or even in a more formal structure like a minor or a certificate. And we've really structured the application almost after a grant a grant application. Um, again, these questions around rating your, your experience level with digital humanities and ethnic studies, uh, courses taught, um, title of your proposed capacity building project, a description in which you tell us the goals of the project. Um, you describe for us how will the proposed project build capacity for digital humanities, um, how many faculty and librarians and students will be served, uh, why you're the right person to do this. Um, so, you know, what of your previous digital humanities sort of efforts um, and efforts to build capacity at your institution been, um, if, if applicable. You, this, you, this may be the first time you're thinking about building institutional capacity for digital humanities. And that's great. That's precisely exactly the kind of work we want to support. Um, what is the deliverable or measurable outcome for your project? So because we've opened up sort of this capacity building uh, fellowship to something that is, you know, proposed by you, uh, we're not sitting here saying there is a single kind of deliverable or outcome we would need to see. So you would need to articulate in this application, what is the outcome uh, or what is a deliverable um, for us? And we would also need a, a timeline um, and a budget. So the budget would need to, um, say, you know, what you would like to spend the money on um, and 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 why. Um, and then as well, the questions around mentorship, what kind of support would you anticipate needing and what is your perform, preferred form um, of mentorship for the project? Um, the other thing I think that's worth adding um, is that the capacity building fellows will meet with a mentor. Um, and we'll meet monthly with a group of fellows. The eligibility requirements are the same. Um, whatever the deliverable is will be due by uh, just September 1st of 2023. Um, but that, you know, we're really open to your expertise on what is needed to build capacity to increase opportunities for students to learn about digital humanities. Um, at your college or at your university. Um, the other sort of question we get about this is around whether this can fund a digital humanities project. And the way we look at it is that if the funding, okay, you're gonna have to help me out with this one. If the funding of the project is itself building capacity for the institution, then it would, you know, certainly be eligible for funding. We and, can't, and I, and I think it's capacity for the institution. And also, I think remember that so much of this is is tied to pedagogy and teaching, right? So, um, so capacity for the institution to engage students in um, learning um, about and through um, digital ethnic humanities. So, I think that's the other piece of the the project part is. Um, not so much for building the capacity of the institution to reach R1 status, um, right? Um, but more building the capacity of the institution to, to fulfill its, its uh, teaching mission. Yes, capacity is about the capacity for teaching digital humanities to students at minority serving institutions. So absolutely. So, you know, we've seen people talking about, you know, there is a, you know, a project that will be, you know, integrated into three different courses and you know it will all be part of that and they you know want support to sort of develop that for faculty and and build out that experience for students that's acceptable on the other hand you know i have a project digitizing this book from the 19th century you know that's not 
the kind of things that we're able to fund um, based on what we told Mellon. So it's projects are only eligible, digital humanities projects rather are only eligible if they're explicitly tied to the pedagogy um, and not just pedagogy for one person's course, but pedagogy you know, across multiple courses, uh, across a department um, or something like that. Hmm. Tasia, is there anything you want to, to add? I think you covered it. I think that, the, the, yeah, the, I mean, the, the big, I think one thing is also to remember um, if you received a teaching fellowship um, last time round, um, you are welcome to apply for a capacity building fellowship this time round. Um, and if you receive a teaching fellowship this time round, um, you are welcome to apply for a capacity building fellowship next time round. Um, so we're really, this is definitely something where if you, if you develop a single course through the teaching fellowship, um, and then you realize like, okay, I can connect this course to a bunch of other courses and, you know, turn this into a certificate or turn this into a much larger um, kind of collaborative um, teaching and learning um, experience, then absolutely those can, those can follow each other. Yeah. And, but you don't have to have received a teaching fellowship to apply yeah. for a capacity building fellowship. If you've been doing this on your own, awesome. Um, you can absolutely apply um, with, without that. Um, we have a question um, from Amy uh, about whether the presentation will be shared. The presentation will be available on our YouTube channel um, as well as on our website. Our website is digitalethnicfutures.org. Um, so we'll have it available in the next couple of days. Um, okay. Um, one note, we often get asked this, are contingent faculty eligible? Absolutely. We support the work of contingent faculty. Um, you're absolutely welcome to apply for a teaching fellowship. Um, if you are in a some kind of position that allows you to work on institutional capacity, like if you're in a, a lectureship position where you're involved in curricular development and in institution building, you're absolutely eligible to apply for a capacity building fellowship. I think that the reason that distinction is there is that capacity building is about capacity building for the institution. Um, so we would just want to make sure that somebody who has the fellowship is in the position where the institution is supporting um, them and their um, and, and their work and welcoming the interventions that they want uh, to make. Um, Keisha, we have a question um, from Oliver about the, um, yeah, credit and non-credit courses. It's a great question. Um, and I think the answer is um, uh, as long as it is a course that is offered um, through your institution, then um, there is not, there is no distinction between credit um, and non-credit bearing courses. So um, absolutely that that is, it's an option if it's a non-credit bearing course. Um, um, as long as it, you know, if it's sort of a, yeah, I think it needs to be offered through some kind of an institutional um, structure, but, um, but that's it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Alicia has a question about mentorship. Alicia, the short answer is absolutely. We definitely want our mentors to come back, please. Um, and I'll talk about mentorship now um, a little bit more. Um, so DEF CON mentors are really important and wonderful part of our community. We're fortunate. We have seen at least three of our mentors on the on the Zoom tonight, maybe more. Um, we're thrilled to have you here. We're so grateful for your work and your mentorship. Um, so everybody who has, gets a teaching fellowship or a capacity building fellowship also will be paired with a mentor. Um, mentors are um, Anyone with experience in digital humanities who wants to, to um, work with colleagues on developing teaching or developing institutional capacity at the intersections of digital humanities and ethnic studies. Um, mentors receive $2,500 stipends for 50 hours of support for fellowship recipients over the eight month um, period. Um, we will have a mentor guide in which we will essentially say mentors and mentees should meet with each other at the beginning of 
their work and figure out a schedule um, for support. We had originally, uh, initially last year said, meet every other week. It turns out that didn't always work for the rhythms of the term and the semester for faculty um, and, or even for mentors. And so um, we've sort of said, this is now really what you need to do is just meet with each other and determine what's a schedule that actually makes sense. Mentors offer support on topics like curricular development, project management, data management, um, sustaining classroom digital humanities projects. Um, their goal, their role is, is an advisory role though look at materials you've developed, give suggestions for readings, give feedback on syllabi and assignments and curriculum design. Um, they're not able to build projects for you. Um, they, um, but they are really wonderful collaborators and often our mentors reported back that they were learning as much from their experiences of, of being mentors as their mentees that they felt. So it's been really wonderful. Um, part of the of of DEF CON is is this sort of multi directional uh, learning experience. So anybody who works in digital humanities, it doesn't matter what kind of role you work in, um, as long as you're in the U.S. or U.S. territory, um, that is again a Mellon requirement for us. Um, so, oh, Tamika, you have a question. Yes, how are you doing, Vika and, and Kasia? Nice to see you all again. Uh, just to have a two-part question. Um, so about the contingent faculty, if if you if you are a contingent faculty person that previously had participation in curriculum development, but was able to gauge an interest um, and did give special permission from a, um, the dean or a department head as far as to, in order to conduct a professional development, or a campus workshop that's related to digital humanities, um, is that are you possibly eligible or not? Um, uh, so I think I will take that one. So I think um, part if, if you are contingent faculty applying for um, a capacity building, um, uh, I think one of the things that definitely is needs to be part of the application is an articulation of how you have an ability um, at your institution. So what it is. So again, we're sort of asking you to, to, to lay that out. So what, um, what role do you have that actually allows you um, to build capacity at the institution? Um, so, um, you know, if there, if there is a special designation by, um, you know, a administrative body um, that asks or responds to a request to be able to um, build capacity, that would be, a, I would recommend amending, like adding that to the, including that with the application um, to help articulate what that is. Yeah, okay, there's a section on the, sorry, may I add, there's a section on the application um, that asks why you're the right person to do it and that do the project. And that's where you would want to put that in. Um, so, you know, if you have, you know, the blessing of your department chair, department chair says, yes, let's, let's do this and let's um, do this in the department. Um, you know, you, that's, that's the kind of thing we would need to know. It, it's really about actually protecting you not about us or, you know, it's about not wanting faculty who are in positions where their job is actually, they're not getting paid to direct, develop curriculum. They're not getting paid to develop institutional capacity. So we don't want faculty put in a position where they're trying to do this work um, at, in a way that's going to be exploited by the institution. Quick, quick follow-up and thank you so much for answering. Um, um, quick follow-up. So as far as the stipend, what, what the $5,000, is that a, does that go down directly to the institution or is part of that a stipend for the person that's facilitating or how does that work? Yeah, that's a really good question and also connects to an Amy's question from the chat, which is about budget items for the capacity building grant and do the funds go to the grantee or the institution? Okay, so let's we'll tackle the second part the funds go to the do the funds go to the grantee and the institution um <laughs> that 
that's a complicated question. We are trying to, if possible, avoid giving the funds to your institution because it's actually a lot easier for us from a paperwork standpoint to like, if you're saying, I want to bring people to campus, I want to give my colleagues each $500. It's actually a lot easier for us to just pay your colleagues as independent contractors than it is to give money to your institution and then have your institution pay people. And also it's more work for you if you then have to ask your institution to pay people because well, we get to chase finance on our end and then you get to chase finance on your end. And as anyone who's ever had to work with finance knows they're very busy, very competent, but very busy people. Um, and that it's a it's a total um, bureaucracy to work with. So we're actually trying to avoid that. Um, this means that you don't you're not applying your grants office is not applying to us. You are applying to us, and then you are specifying what you would need to do this project. And then Keja and I will figure out the easiest way to get people paid that tries to avoid actually having to sub award money to your institution. And the, the other thing to be clear on um, is that um, Mellon does not fund um, uh, material, like computers, um, programs, things like that. Um, so um, this is funding for sort of people work, um, time, training, um, um, those sorts of things. So I think that was the, to, to further answer that, the budget items for capacity building grant, um, things like um, the time that it takes to develop a proposal for um, a program, the time that it takes to develop and deliver um, professional development for colleagues, um, the time that it takes to um, collaborate and coordinate um, uh, program building. Um, those sorts of things are really the, the, the sort of those are the central sorts of things. There, there are satellite things that need to happen around those also. Um, Yes. Yeah. So you um, can pay yourself. You can pay students. You can pay your colleagues. You can pay speakers. Um, you cannot buy a laptop. You cannot buy a scanner. You can. You know the equipment costs. Melon has said no. Um, uh, we asked. <laughs> um, salary stipend. I mean, yeah. You pay yourself. Um, if you say, listen, I want five thousand dollars for the time I'm going to spend developing this curriculum and writing these courses and writing these. Uh, these governance documents, that's totally fine. If you're saying, you know, uh, you know, we had one of our partners, um, they brought on a student to be part of a curriculum re revamp. They want to pay the student, pay the student. You know, you want to do a faculty learning community and give everybody a $500 stipend for participating pay them um, or you want, if you wanted like read it, you needed books for a faculty learning community, we could pay for that. We just can't really buy computers and scanners and things like that. So um, those are the, those are the kinds of things that you would, you would want um, to, to budget for. Um, so think about, you know, I mean, just as somebody who writes a lot of grants, the uh, it's often daunting to think about making a budget when you've never had money to spend, um, which is mostly the, experience I've been in in my career. I was at Salem State for nine years and Kasia can vouch, like we have no money for anything. And so even just trying to start and thinking about what would I even spend money on is a really weird question to ask. But I would start by thinking, what is it, what is activity, you know, the main goal you have, what are the activities you want to do? And then what kind of money would help make those activities happen? Um, and paying people for their time is certainly a way that can make things happen. Um, and, a, and very, you know, whether it's paying yourself or whether it's paying colleagues or bringing someone to campus, um, paying for travel for somebody to campus, paying an honorarium for a speaker or for a virtual event, things like that are all. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to see if there are any other questions that are- uh, um, Nandini has a hand up. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm trying to see if there's any other questions in the chat that are related to this. Oh, yes. Got oh, it. here we go. So, okay. Um, um, Nandini has a question about visa restrictions, U.S. citizen requirements. We handled that. We um, put on our, on our call um, that we will work with people who, so the main issue with visa, so we, we can pay people who are not U.S. citizens. This is not a problem. The question is around whether people can't get paid by us because of their visas. 
And that we've run into that where somebody has said, I want to participate, but I can't be paid by you because my visa doesn't allow me to. And in that case, we've been able to get money to the institution that they work at and their institution can pay them because we apparently can't legally pay them, but we can give money to their institution and their institution can pay them. So that's our workaround in that case. So the restriction doesn't come from us because we can pay people. It's whether you legally can be paid by us. Um, and if not, is your institution okay with taking a, a sub award from us so we, and paying you? Um, was that your primary question, Anthony? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, so I'm just gonna go back to, so we don't miss any questions. Oh, we had a question from, from um, Oliver. Uh, do courses have to be listed or cross-listed as other things studies? They do not. Um, we've had courses in all, we had courses in communications. We had courses in Latinx studies, courses in black studies, courses in English, courses in, that is not um, a matter at all. Um, we often know that our in our institutions um, and in the fields we work in, we kind of have to like get our courses in under whatever we can get them <laughs> approved under. So there is no requirement. It's just that the, the content of the course should include some digital humanities and something from at least one eth ethnic studies field. Um, yeah, which ties to the question, would a diversity course be eligible for a teaching fellowship? And I think um, similarly, uh, it, probably, um, it definitely, you know, a course that is, um, I don't know, like a, a HR diversity, like a maybe not um, if it's if it's studying like institutional practices rather than ethnic studies. But even so, yeah, I think you could probably make the argument. Um, so um, I I'm, uh, would love to hear more what you meant by a diversity course, but um, but a, a course that is engaging in ethnic studies um, is absolutely eligible as long as the teaching fellowship is in order to um, expand that so that it is engaging also in um, in digital studies. So we had an example last year, we had somebody who was teaching essentially their departments in diversity course, I put that in quotation marks. Um, and um, what they really wanted to do was really augment, you know, it's ethnic studies content and it's digital humanities content. And that turned out to be a really good experience. Um, they're very happy with their experience um, because they came up with a course that was really, you know, engaged really thoughtfully in like particular forms of new media. And then also actually pushed beyond the kind of diversity course mentality that was her department had and uh, really came up with a course that's um, was more meaningful than the course that was sort of handed to her and said, go teach the diversity course. Um, so um, we have a question about um, private R2 HBCUs. Private institutions are not um, fundable through this grant. Um, unfortunately, that's a melon. They, they gave us the money for public universities. Um, well, specifically for public um, non-R1 universities. Um, we have a question from Amy about, oh, Kasia, I need your help on this one. Paying for online accounts for hosting projects? I think that the answer is no. Um, I, the, um, the, they, Mellon has been really like, not the, not the platforms, um, not, the, not the kind of um, hardware or software um, pieces. Um, but Amy, one thing I would say is like, it's entirely possible you can do what you want to do without needing to pay for it. I mean, it really depends on what you're trying to do. And there may be opportunities to explore um, other kinds of um, opportunities. I'm happy to chat with you. Um, and also, if you apply and or get a, get a fellowship, it's, your mentor would also be able to talk to you about that as well. So just so you know. Um, oftentimes people go in by Wix because like they think that's the uh, like really only option the only easiest option but there are often other workarounds or there may be things you can access at your institution potentially that um, uh, could help you with what you want to do. Um, 
Oliver's asking about deliverable database. Okay, so we didn't, uh, so for teaching fellowships, um, who do we have here? We have, oh, uh, Robert, could you say a little bit about the course that you developed? And, and then Nika, maybe you could say a little bit about yours. Sure. You know, I think in some ways that also helps answer. I've been watching the chat too, a little like, what is digital humanities? Uh, I'm here in Southern Oregon, near the California border, Southern Oregon University, a regional, small, you know, state. We're not the beavers or the ducks, but there's a lot of uh, Latinx uh, community. Um, and I knew that uh, the, the, the vague idea I had was a digital repository working in partnership with Latinx organizations, specifically agricultural and migrant workers uh, supporting organizations to um, collect the stories and other uh, cultural artifacts, folk music, folk art and song and of, of the Latinx communities and uh, have it be this sort of living uh, partnership between the university and the community to uh, collect stories. And that to me was, was a, I, I learned through the year, especially with my mentor, Margaret Ree, uh, what digital humanities is and was. And in fact, it, I didn't have an idea of a, of a platform or a tech to start when I made my proposal and that was okay. I feel like um, DEF CON and the Mellon Foundation supported my year long learning about, oh, you know, there are ways to do this without paying a subscription <laughs> to a sponsor. So I hope that helps. I know there's another fellow here who might have an example. We also have some mentors too, who I might uh, co-opt into talking if you're willing, but Tamika, please go ahead. Yeah, so I've um, taught music appreciation, jazz history courses. And so I, I found a way through this um, initiative last year to kind of really bring it up to date with digital humanities and um, having including the social justice piece, having students um, really respond to how people of color are, are portrayed over the internet and especially in jazz and also having uh, projects where students, um, they document uh, jazz performances and respond to jazz performances and just to kind of really create a digital kind of archive on the, uh, on the internet um, that's in reference to jazz history. So there's, I mean, it's um, what I learned from basically from um, participating last year that it, it's not always as high tech or coding and, and you can get into those things, but you can do some things that are very simple with the things that we have available to us. And, and, it, and it is still considered digital humanities. Yeah, so um, I'm not sure if um, Alessio, Marina or, um, Alicia, if you, either of you um, want to say a bit of, yeah. Um, I would say that you sh really shouldn't be afraid um, of the digital component. It's um, none of us are going to teach you how to code in R. We're, we're not going to do that because we love you and we love ourselves. Um, so really, I think that, you know, for example, my mentee, um, Dr. Golding, she didn't have a lot of experience with digital humanities per se, but you actually might have more experience that you know. Uh, you might use low bridge, what we call like low bridge technology in your everyday class. You use Google Slides, you use, um, you know, some kind of um, museums, ex online exhibitions, you use Kahoot if you do languages or test or polling everywhere, you're using low bridge technology. What we want to do is use kind of that foundation in low bridge and, trans and transfer it into really creating a syllabus that is oriented towards digital, digital humanities um, and specifically in assessments and building projects. So for example, with, uh, with my mentee, we created um, easy, mapping platforms accessible uh, for students and as a project. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Marina, I see you unmuting. Oh yes, I went off the phone so I'm not used to this. Um, I was a mentor last year and it was a wonderful experience. I feel like I gained as much out of it as my mentee did. Um, it was a chance for me to think about some of what I do in my own courses 
as well as like give feedback to someone. So I felt it was a very, it was more like having a partner um, than a hierarchical relationship. That's kind of what I have to say about my experience. I'm very excited to apply to be a mentor again this year. And I did have a question on the mentor application. It had said, it had asked us to list the methods that we're comfortable working with. And I wasn't sure like by that, did you mean certain platforms or what would be an example of something we would write in that section? Thank you so much for that great question and also for sharing your experiences as a, as a mentor. And this is also, um, LSCO had the same question. Um, so essentially, it could be saying, I'm comfortable with digital mapping. I'm comfortable with text analysis. I'm comfortable with Omeka or WordPress. It could be methods themselves, or it could just be platforms you're comfortable with. Um, it's just to get a sense of what you're interested in um, in, 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 in doing. Uh, sorry, what you're what you're interested in in your own work, so that we can match you with people who uh, it would be a good fit. Because if you're like, if you just have no interest in mapping, uh, just for example, um, and we had somebody who wanted to do a mapping project, we wouldn't we wouldn't pair we would, we would pair you with pair them with 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 Lucia instead. <laughs> so um, just for the matching. So yeah, I mean, it could be specific tools. It could be broad digital methods. Um, you know, stylometry, text analysis, digital mapping. Um, why can't I think of anything right now? It's late and I'm very jet lagged, but um, that's, that's digital, a good list digital, of digital editions, like, yeah. TEI, um, we had a TEI X text encoding initiative. If you're not familiar with it is um, the language you use to, to digitize texts. And we had a TEI expert um, last year as a mentor and somebody who was doing a TEI project. So we paired them together. Um, but yeah, those are the questions. I, did we add that question to the application this year? I feel like I had to have asked that last year. Um, I feel you didn't give a poor answer. Ah. Or I something in and I didn't know what I was, what I was saying. I have a follow-up question because I also noticed it was mentioning like working in small groups versus one-on-one. -on -one. And so I was wondering, I was wondering if you had ideas of how the format might look this year in terms of the mentorship experience, if there's more than one person, um, or is that something that will just unfold based on, based on individual interests? So this came out of feedback from mentors at and mentees. Um, so we had people saying like, oh, I wish I had had a group or I wish I, you know, and so what we thought we would do is ask for preferences and then match up people with shared preferences. Um, so, you know, there are people who really were like, I really want a small group uh, of people to mentor. And then uh, we wouldn't want to put them with somebody who says, I want a one-to-one -one mentorship relationship. So it's really an opportunity for you to express what you would like and what you feel like you have the capacity for. And then we would match you up with somebody who wants the same thing. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, we ha uh, Suryati, you've had your hand up for a long time. I'm so sorry. Yes, um, I just would like to clarify uh, because the diversity course I'm teaching is for uh, pre-service teachers and uh, the topics that we cover, they're basically, basically um, social justice in education where we uh, discuss about, uh, you know, issues pertaining to racism, discrimination, oppression, sexism, ableism. So uh, does this also count? is, uh, you know, what you meant by ethnic studies in that sense? Yeah, so I've taught that course mm -hmm. many times uh, well, mm -hmm. when I was at Film State. Um, and uh, we had two people who did courses sort of re related to that last year. Mm -hmm. um, both, I think both were actually methods courses, um, mm -hmm. but were at, in Asian American studies, just mm -hmm. totally randomly that they both were. So, I mean, certainly you're dealing with questions of race, questions of racism, mm -hmm. uh, those are issues that are so you know you know one of the things to be thinking about is how can you ensure that the perspectives that you're using in the courses are sort of coming out of you know of, of scholarship that's grounded in ethnic studies i mean i know if you're using like gloria ladson billings work for example um which often you teach that one teaches that in cultural responsive teaching mm -hmm. like that's that's certainly informed by ethnic studies mm -hmm. um so, I mean, certainly that's, you know, uh, I posted a, a copy of the list of last year's courses into the mm -hmm. chat for everybody to see, um, because you can see it's very, very broad. Mm -hmm. uh, 
it doesn't have to be a course that's specifically labeled ethnic studies or black studies or Asian American studies mm -hmm. to be eligible. It has to be courses that engage with the themes behind um, ethnic studies, which are around about race and racialization and identity formation and belonging. Um, mm. Does that help? Yes, I think uh, that sort of like uh, aligns with what I'm doing because uh, it's really very broad. So I just want to be sure that, you know, uh, I mean, before I apply, whether it matches and aligns with uh, the objective of this teaching fellowship. But thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, one of the things that a lot of the, you know, our twos are regional, our regional comprehensive universities that started as teachers, teachers colleges, Salem State was one of them. And so we absolutely are excited when we get applicants from people uh, who are working in education and working with pre-service teachers because blending the ethnic studies and the digital literacy and the digital humanities is really useful for students. It's something I did a lot at Salem State. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's really, um, it's really can be meaningful for students. Yeah, um, um, I've been using a lot of like digital tools with my pre-service teachers, uh, but also I'm hoping to like, you know, elevate their experiences um, through this digital humanities. Thank you. And, um, and I also just want to say, as as much as um, it works well to learn more about what um, digital study, studies is through the project, um, it also can work well to learn more about what ethnic studies means through this, right? So we're hoping that you come with some experience in um, at least one. It certainly will be easier um, if you come in with some experience with at least one, but if more of your experience is in digital um, humanities and less of your experience is in ethnic studies, or at least, you know, as it's a, the same, as Alicia was saying, you may well sort of think that you have no experience in ethnic studies and realize, oh, actually, I have tons of experience. I just haven't called it that. Um, but, but you can absolutely come from both sides. So there is a question about sort of examples um, of, so I, I posted the list of courses. Um, we will soon have, I just haven't had time, um, have the syllabi that were developed last year on our humanities commons group, which you can um, access through our, our website and join. Um, we did not do capacity building fellowships last year. We put out a call for them and we got zero applicants. And the way they were structured last year was that it was only for creating a minor or a certificate program. And what we realized through our conversations with our mentors, with our fellows, is that like we needed a more expansive understanding of what it meant to build capacity. So we've put examples on our call um, for the kinds of activities you might do, but you're not limited to those. Um, so we don't have any examples from last year precisely because we didn't run it like that last year. And the way we tried to run it was not suitable for um, the needs of all of us, um, for, for needs of our, of our community. Um, I've also, for those of you who are curious about digital humanities, I've posted our resource page um, from our website, which has lots of really um, interesting resources and places you can look uh, to learn a little bit more about digital humanities. Something to know is that we use a really expansive definition of digital humanities. We don't really police what digital humanities is, um, which is something that often makes people nervous about digital humanities. What is this term? What does it mean? Uh, we really are thinking about work that is bringing together digital technologies, digital pedagogies, digital teaching tools with scholarship, with reading, with content in Black studies, Latinx studies, Native and Indigenous studies, Asian American studies, um, one, multiple of those, one of those, all of those. Um, so it's really a space to like explore. Um, it's a space to develop your knowledge and develop your creativity. Um, it's a, it is the teaching fellowships in particular are for people who are curious about digital humanities um, uh, or want or feel like they're they've done it and they're confident and want to level up. Um, so it's not meant to be something where we're like we're looking at your class and like oh, that's not digital humanities. You know we're looking at it and we're seeing okay, we think that we can provide the support that will help you develop a course that will result in a meaningful experience for your students. So it, it's almost seven o'clock. Um, 
we're really grateful to all of you for being here today. All our applications are due January 13th. Um, I will put our website in the chat um, as well as a direct link to all our calls where you can get links to our applications. Um, and also you can contact um, us. I'll put our email address as well in the chat so you know who to contact if you have any questions as you're preparing your applications. We're really grateful to all of you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Uh, how will we get an access of that slavers that you're talking about? I'm sorry, get access to the slides? Uh, the syllabus you were talking about. The syllabus. Oh, oh, oh. Um, so we, uh, hold on one second. Sorry, I'm trying to do two things. So those, the, the ones from last year, we are in the process of getting them up. So, um, um, so those will be on the website. Um, soon <laughs> um so um yeah they'll sure. be on the humanities commons yes okay. some are actually already there some are oh, already really? yeah some are already are already there i just don't know how well they're organized and findable that's the problem um but if you also if you want to email me um you can email us at this email address we can send you some examples okay perfect thank you hi will <laughs> I'll, I'll save that. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Have a good evening.